So, um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Unite Berlin. I'm uh, very happy that we're finally doing this in my hometown. Um, so, my name is Jonas Echterhoff. I'm a developer at Unity. One of the things I've been working on is uh, our WebGL uh, export. And one question which I've always run into when uh, helping people bring their content to WebGL is the question of build size. When you want to publish your content to the web, uh, it's very important that your, your content starts up fast, it loads very fast, and you want, to, want it to load as part of a web page. To get there, you have to make sure that your content is as small as possible. Also specific on WebGL, everything has to fit into memory because you don't have file system access. So we did a lot of work helping people bring the build size down. So I decided to do a talk about that because it's also uh, it's, it's very relevant to, to the web platform. Oh. Now this is not working anymore. Um, but it's also an important question on other platforms, like when you're, uh, when you're targeting mobile. So let's look at why would you care about build size? So when I say build size, I mean the deployment size of, of your build, how much space it takes on the device, um, how, much, how, much space, how, mu how much size people need to download before they can start playing your content. Um, the answer to that is pretty simple. You care about build size because of user reach. Huh. Um, the bigger your build is, the longer it takes for people to download it, the longer it takes, uh, takes to get started playing your content. So the, higher the, uh, the bigger the build is, the higher the chances that people might end up not downloading it or interrupting the download in intentionally or unintentionally. Also, the bigger you build is, the more space it will take on the user's device, which makes it more likely that people will uh, delete it to make space for something else. Like, I, I want to take a photo on my phone. It says no more space, uh, no more space left. So I'm going to look at what's the biggest apps. And if, you're, if yours is on top there, chances are I'm going to delete that if I think I don't need it very badly. So to put this in numbers, I read this article from, um, from the UX team of the App Store, uh, the Google Play Store. And there's an in interesting quote here. It says, for every six megabyte increase to an APK size, we see a decrease in the install conversion rate of 1%. So the install conversion rate that's the amount of, of people who are looking at an app on the App Store who will end up having it installed on the device. So a 1% uh, drop in install conversion rate is 1% less users for your app. So that directly reflects to your revenue. So if you look at that, everything you can do to reduce your build size, every megabyte you can save directly translates into revenue. Another interesting takeaway from that article is that, um, that these numbers are not globally universal. There's, uh, there's differences depending on your target markets. So what the article also said is that the average app APK downloaded in emerging markets, such as by people in the Middle East, Africa, and Southeast Asia, a quarter of the size of apps downloaded by people in developed market, such as in the US and Western Europe. Uh, reasons for that is that people tend to have less powerful devices with less storage space, but more importantly, uh, less access to Wi-Fi. In, uh, in emerging markets, a lot of people are relying on uh, cellular connections only, which means that any download you do directly costs you on, on your data plan. I actually watched a presentation about localization a while ago. And uh, one thing they mentioned there is they would, uh, um, 
they would uh, have different qualities of their assets depending on the target market. Like when you're targeting a game for India, you would use uh, lower quality textures because the trade-off between fidelity and build size is a different one there because people are less likely to download your game if it's big. Um, if you are interested in uh, more information on this, I, I, I thought this article was very useful. So it was called uh, Shrinking APKs, Growing Installs. Um, there's a link here you can check out if you want to read this. Another reason to care about build size is uh, the App Store size limits. So if you want to publish your game to iOS, the iOS App Store has a 150 megabytes over the air limit. That means that any app larger than 150 megabytes cannot be downloaded on a cellular connection and can only be downloaded on, on Wi-Fi. Likewise, the Google Play Store has a 100 megabyte app limit. It's possible to have apps larger than that, but the user experience for that is not good uh, because I think there are some warning messages people have to deal with. So when, when I said that install conversion rates drop with build size, these numbers uh, are important to know because this is where there's some specific drops which are much higher. So you probably don't want to publish an app which is just slightly over these limits. Then you should work very hard trying to get below those. Um, but there's cases where you want to be much smaller than this. Like when you look at the Google Play Store, they recently introduced a new feature called Google Play Instant where you can have a Try Now button in the App Store interface. And then you can click on that. And the, the Play Store will download a trial version of your app, which will then instantly load without having the user to install it. So this is a, a great way to get users interested in your app, because you, you can just click on it and instantly play it. But to use this feature, your app can be no bigger, or the instant version of your app can be no bigger than 10 megabytes. T now, 10 megabytes is pretty small. It's possible to reach this in Unity, uh, but then you'll see that the Unity engine code itself takes up, up most of that. So you have very little space left for your actual game and your assets. Uh, so let's look more into um, how you can understand your build size. The first question is, how, how big is your build actually? Well, typically that's pretty trivial to find out. You make a build and you look in the Finder or Windows Explorer how big it is. On iOS, it's a bit more complicated, at least when you care about the build size as uh, interpreted by the App Store for the 150 megabyte limit. Uh, because Apple has its own metrics, which involve compression and stripping of uh, unused uh, binary formats, unused architectures. So to understand uh, the, your build size relevant to the uh, iOS App Store, the simplest way is to just upload it to iTunes Connect and uh, check the size reported on the web interface. Um, now you can also on most platforms look into the build, like here's the Mac app, but that's really just a folder, so you can look into it and look in the files. You can see how much is executable code, how much is data files, how much is levels. Uh, you can do that on most platforms. If you may make an Android build, you have an APK, but that's really just a zip file, so you can rename it to zip and decompress it and look inside. But when we want to get more information of what's in those files, um, the first thing you can look at is your editor log file. The editor log file is always written by Unity when you run an editor session. Uh, its location is platform specific. On the Mac, I think it's in uh, your home directory slash library slash uh, log slash unity. Uh, it's, uh, you can check in the manual the location of that file. So when you make a build in Unity, the uh, editor log file contains a section called the build report. And uh, this contains uh, some data on each individual asset um, 
and the size, uh, like each individual asset which was included in the build and the size it contributes, and also a breakdown on how much of your build size is spent on, on different asset types, typically the biggest being textures. Now, this has been in Unity, I guess, since pretty much forever. But the data actually comes from an object uh, called, also called build report. And uh, we have started making some of that information available for better access through an API. So in 18.1, we introduced the build report script editor scripting API. When you make a build using the... Um, the editor API using build pipeline .build player, it will return an object of, uh, of type build report, which you can then get information on using the build report API. It has properties like how long did the build take, what were the individual steps during the build, and how long did they take, which files were written to disk. Um, and it also has information about native code stripping, which I will get to later. So this is all very useful, but what I'd really like is some graphical representation of uh, that information. Um, now, we are working on, at some point, getting something like that built into Unity. We don't have that yet, but now that we have the API, we can build something inside Unity. Uh, and I spent some time doing that, and I'm going to show that right now. So let me... Switch to Unity. Uh, here's the Unity editor. And I have a script selected here called Build Report Inspector. As you can maybe see here, it's uh, just a custom editor on the Build Report class. So I'm using the Build Report API to, to get some information out of it. Not all the information in that object is uh, already available through public APIs. So I used some tricks to use uh, the serialization system using the uh, serialized object class to get some more information out of it. So now, this editor script adds the menu item here. Open last build report. We're going to click that. And now in the inspector, I hope you can see that. Um, we see an inspector showing the last build report object here. It has some, some general information, the name of the project I've been building. We made an Android build. Uh, and I have a few tabs here. You can see that uh, we first it built all the scenes, then we compiled the scripts. We can also look into here. There were some compiler warnings. Uh, there's some more steps, packaging all the assets. Uh, in the end, the last step was creating the APK package, and then the build was done. We can look at the source assets which contribute to the build. So there's a list of all the assets by size. We can also look at them by files written to disk or by asset uh, types. We can see the biggest uh, by far here is textures. Audio is also big. This project, by the way, is the... Uh, 2D Learn project included in Unity, which you can access uh, from, uh, from the new project tab. We can also see the output files written to the disk. Since we made an Android build, there's just one APK file. And there's a tab on stripping information, which will show you which uh, Unity modules, which subsystems of the Unity engine were included in the build code. Uh, including information as to why they were included. So, like, we have the physics module here, which implements 3D physics, and we can see that was included because there's a box collider, which is included because it's part of several scenes here. I will get back to that later. And I'm going to go back to my slides for now. Now, this is the build report inspector. I... Uh, have submitted this to the asset store, but I didn't get it approved yet, so I just uploaded this to a URL here if you want to try it yourself. I, ho I hope this will help people get some information on how to optimize their builds. Um, I also hope that eventually we'll have something like this built into Unity, but for now, since we have the build report API, we can, you can get this information, and I hope this helps getting getting uh, drilling down into your build size. 
So now that you, you get some information on uh, which assets uh, use how much size, the question is, what can you actually do about that? What can you do to reduce your build size? What can you do to reduce the, the size footprint of these assets? So the first question you should look at is, are, are all your assets actually used? So Unity doesn't include assets in your build which are not referred by any of the scenes you're building. And you might think this question is trivial because you look at the assets and, and you should know. But if you, if you have a big uh, project, it's very hard to actually keep track of why is this model used and why is this texture used. Um, you might have some prefab with a, like a character which has a model and uh, some textures which you actually never instantiate in your game. So it's, it's interesting to find out what's actually referencing these assets. Unity doesn't have a built-in way to show you where references to assets come from, but there's some asset store packages to help on that. There's uh, one called the Asset Usage Finder, which is a $20 package uh, you can get on the Asset Store, which allows you to pick any asset and then get a list of any references to it. And there's also a free one called Asset Usage Detector. So um, I recommend checking these out and just uh, looking over your assets, especially if you have any doubt if you actually need all of them. The next thing I would look at is uh, your texture sizes. Often when you work with artists, they would give you uh, very high resolution textures because it always makes sense to get high resolution data first uh, and then you can use your meshes at any size and look at them really close. But often for shipping your game, you don't want uh, all that high resolution. Um, now the question is, how do you find out what's a good resolution uh, for, for your textures to use? Because in, in the texture importer, there's a dropdown for texture size, so you can choose a lower size than the texture data actually is, and then Unity will just drop mipmap mip levels higher than that, and you, you use much less size on textures. Um, in the scene view, uh, in the render mode pop-up, there's a mode called mipmap view. When you choose that, your scene view will look like the screenshot. And uh, what Unity will do is it will shade your textures in either red or blue, depending on if, whether the texture information or the, the pixel density is too high or too low for the uh, current view and screen resolution. So if you size your um, scene view to match your res the resolution you want to target and uh, match the camera to some views you care about, you can get an idea if uh, the texture sizes you use are sufficient and if you can get away reducing your texture sizes. Um, another thing I want to look at is the serialized scene data. If you build a scene in Unity, that's basically a binary file containing like all your game objects in your scene and uh, all your components with all their properties serialized to disk. So sometimes you may have a lot of instances of the same objects in the scene. Like here's an example. Uh, this is a component, a mono behavior called a floor tile, which you could imagine as a floor tile in a game where you can, can run around. And it, it uh, contains some properties a floor tile might have, like uh, how the tile might interact with a player, uh, some objects like particles which might be instantiated when interacting with it, uh, some physical properties. Now, if you look at this, there's some booleans, which are one byte each. There's some floats, which are four bytes, and there's some reference types, which are 12 bytes. The total size of this is 112 bytes. That's not much, but you might have 10,000 of these in the scene, which then adds up. So typically, if you have a lot of identical objects in the scene, you have those because you... Um, you're using prefabs, and, um, and you have a lot of instances of the, the prefabs. So in the editor, this will just be stored as a reference to the, pre, pre, uh, to the prefab file. But when you make a build of a player, like prefabs, they're an editor-only feature. So once you make a build, all the prefabs are resolved, and uh, you, you have, end up having many copies of the same data on disk. So what you maybe uh, looking at doing instead, if you have a lot of instan instances of the same or very similar objects, is to move that data into a scriptable object. So here we have an object 
I call a floor tile data holder, which is a scriptable object. Uh, a scriptable object is a is a serialized uh, script scripting data which can be written to an asset file. So now all this data is just in, in one asset. And then in your mono behavior, you can just reference that data indirectly. Uh, and then you just have one, uh, one reference type. Um, so especially if you have, I mean, this is a simple example, but you might have more complex uh, game objects of which you have a lot of instances where you also instant, like have more components. So you could have a simple uh, data type holder, which then on instantiation or on, on uh, startup, you would uh, unpack to your whole asset. This is an optimization you, which may be useful if you have a lot of uh, copies of the same data in a scene. The next thing I want to talk about is compression. So in, in Unity, there's, there's two types of uh, compression applied to assets. One is like data file compression, which is lossless compression ap applied to all your assets. Um, there's a pop-up in the build player window for the compression method to use. It has three options. There's default compression, which on most platforms is none. Uh, some platforms have uh, custom compression. Uh, Android, for instance, does zip as part of the APK. And then we offer LZ4 and LZ4HC compression. Um, these formats are compression formats meant mostly for very uh, fast decompression. So they're not the uh, smallest compression uh, you can get, typically, which uh, typically you, uh, you would use some more efficient compression in the container for distributing your games. Like uh, the app stores would, uh, would apply some compression on your data anyways. But this is relevant for the data size on disk because we, when you use LZ4 or LZ4HC, we will only decompress your data once it is loaded from disk. And uh, LZ4 is uh, generally so fast that decompressing it is faster than uh, loading from disk. So that means that by, by using this, you will not only save uh, disk size, but you will also speed up the startup times of your game because uh, like, yeah, the decompression is, is faster than the loading. Um, the other compression we have in Unity is asset-specific compression formats. So for some asset formats, you can get much higher compression ratios as, than you can get by a general purpose compressor. If you have a compressor which is aware of the asset file format and can, can perform some uh, lossy compression on that data. So the first data type where we, uh, where we have that is meshes. Uh, in the mesh importer inspector, there's a mesh compression pop-up, which allows, uh, by default it's off, and it allows three different levels of compression. The mesh compression in Unity is pretty simple. It's just basic quantization of the mesh data, meaning that we just store your vertices and normals in a lower resolution. Uh, my general advice for any of these asset-specific compressions is to try different compression ratios and see what you can get away with without visually losing quality. For meshes, since we're storing uh, the data at a lower resolution, generally you can get away with a pretty high compression on any mesh where, which has uh, vertices kind of uh, evenly spread out in, the, in space. Um, you have more problems if you have a mesh which is pretty big but has some very small details because then these tend to, uh, tend to lose their detail and then might uh, shift in position. But yeah, so just uh, try different settings and see what looks well. The next format where we have asset-specific compression is audio. Um, for audio, generally, we support ARC Vorbis, though on some platforms which have built-in support for proprietary formats like AAC or MP3, we, we may uh, use those. Likewise, we have a slider which allows you to choose compression format. Um, and there's an info box below those settings which shows, show you the original and compressed size. So once again, uh, choose, uh, play around with the setting and listen to the audio and see what uh, still sounds well. 
And the next one I'm uh, going to talk about is textures. Um, for textures, we support, we generally support on each platform the native GPU formats uh, supported by the platform. So on desktops, that is uh, DXT or BC5, BC7. On mobiles, there's uh, different formats depending on which devices you're targeting. That may be ETC, ASTC, or PVRTC. Uh, what all these formats have in common is that they are uh, designed to, uh, to reduce the memory footprint in video memory on the GPU. So the, the textures will stay compressed on, on the GPU. Um, and they are, they are all block-based formats, meaning that a block, typically by four by four uh, pixels, or some have other sizes, but that you have a block of textures and that each block has the same size, regardless of what's in it. Um, and this means that the GPU, since each block has the same size, can easily find the location of a block containing a specific pixel because it, uh, because it, can just, it knows the offset to it. Now, this is very well suited for uh, getting the most out of, uh, out of the GPU and the GPU memory, but it is not the best way to store texture data on disk, because if you look at general purpose image compression formats like, like JPEG, you can get much better compression ratios than this. Now, the problem, if we were using JPEG and Unity, is that we'd, uh, when you uncompress JPEG, you have... Uh, uh, uncompressed texture data, which is not optimal for using on the GPU. We could recompress it, but then you'd have double compression artifacts and it would be very slow. And this is a shame because texture size, as we saw, tends to be the largest uh, percentage of asset data. So what we added support for in Unity is uh, a texture compression method called Crunch. Now what Crunch does, Crunch is a, a lossy texture compression uh, method similar in uh, characteristics and, uh, and compression ratios to JPEG, but it decompresses straight into a GPU format, which can then be used directly uh, by, the, uh, by the engine which, uh, without sacrificing si uh, space on, on video memory. Um, now, we added crunch support in Unity uh, 5.3, uh, but generally, it wasn't used that much. The reason for that is um, that, we only, that Crunch only supports DXT textures, so it can only be used on desktop and WebGL, um, but not on mobiles where people care a lot about build size. And the other complaint we got is that it takes much too long to uh, run the compression, so you have to basically run your project overnight to import all the assets. So. In 17.3, we added an update to Crunch. My colleague, Alexander Sovorov, he has been working on this for a while and uh, been digging into the Crunch code to optimize it. So in 17.3, we added mobile support to Crunch by supporting uh, a Crunch-based format which would decompress into, into ETC 1 or 2. We optimized the compression further, so it's on average 10% smaller. And we made it much faster. So in in 17.3, it's already faster. In 18.1, we landed more optimization. So in 18.1, on average, it's five times faster to compress. So if you have been evaluating Crunch for your project before and decided it's, it's not useful to you, maybe this is a good time to take another look. Uh, now, the final thing I want to talk about for um, for asset data size, if you've done all these things and you find that you still can't get your build small enough, you should consider putting your assets into asset bundles. Um, asset bundles in Unity allow you to store assets in a file outside of your main build data. Um, I'm not going to get, go into details about how to, uh, on how to do that because that's a subject by itself and there's a lot of tutorials and documentation about that. Um, but the, gen the general idea is that you can move assets into files outside of your data and then load those dynamically, download those and load those into the game dynamically at runtime. And this allows you to defer the loading of your data into the, uh, later into, 
into the play. So people can get started playing your game very fast with a very small download. And then you can offer them a slice of your game while downloading the next parts. So you can, uh, you you can get a much better user conversion while still having more, more data to, to load. You can also cache asset bundles uh, in Unity so that you don't need to download them again every time you load. Um, now, the next thing I want to talk about is executable size. Executable size is the size of all the code uh, contained in your build. That's both the, uh, the native machine code for the Unity engine it's itself uh, and your managed code for, for your game code and for all the .NET system libraries, which, if you're using IELTS CPP, also get converted into native machine code. Um, now, you might w think, why do I even care about executable size? Uh, because executable size may only be a very small uh, part of your distribution size. That's generally true if you have uh, a big project. Um, but as I mentioned, there's a lot of use cases for targeting very small sizes, like uh, Google in uh, Instant uh, Apps is one example where you have a 10 megabyte limit. So if, if your executable code is uh, 8 megabytes, you just have 2 megabytes left for assets. So if you can save 2 megabytes of the executable size, that doubles how much assets you can use. It also matters like when you want to make a small starter scene for, scene, for instance, for a WebGL game, where you want to have a very small initial download. You can put all your assets in asset bundles, but you cannot put code in asset bundles. So your initial download always needs to contain all the executable code. So, if, so it may indeed be very interesting to see how you can get that to be smaller. So what Unity does is it supports code stripping. Now, co code stripping means that we analyze your, um, your game and your executable code, and we try to remove parts which uh, Unity considers uh, not needed for the project. Um, there's two levels of code stripping. The first is managed code stripping. Uh, on Mono, you can uh, manually turn on managed code stripping for platforms which support it, like Android, um, in this pop-up in player settings. In IOTCPP, cpp managed code stripping is always enabled. So managed code stripping basically looks at all your managed code and removes any types or functions which are not invoked. And, and generally, this is uh, meant to just work. Uh, in some cases, when you use reflection, where you access a type or method uh, by its name at runtime, this may break. So you may have to provide a linker XML file where you whitelist certain uh, types uh, from being stripped. Now, the other level of code stripping is native code stripping, which is supported on IELTS CPP, uh, on WebGL, Android, and iOS currently. So on these platforms, you will see a checkbox strip engine code in the player settings. If this is enabled, Unity will look at, uh, at your project and try to remove any modules of the Unity engine, like modules are components like the audio subsystem, the animation system, the physics system, the 3D physics system, 2D physics system. And it will look at, at all the API, all the Unity API calls you're using, and it will look at all the components in your scene to determine which of these should be used in, in, uh, in your build. Uh, again, generally, this is m meant to just work. And in most cases, it does. In some cases, when you use asset bundles, you may have some components not in your main build, and then you have to tell Unity about that so that these are not being stripped. But the problem has been that this is kind of just a black box. You turn it on, your build gets a little bit uh, smaller or a lot smaller, depending on, uh, on your project. But we haven't really supplied good ways to dig into what's going on and how you can optimize that. And that's something we've been looking at uh, changing. 
So I'm going to go back into Unity. Again, here is the stripping view in the, in the Unity editor, where we can see that uh, the physics module is included because there's a box collider in the scenes, and also because it's used by, uh, by the scripting code. So let's see, we're, it says there's a box collider in zone1.unity, which is a scene I have open here. So I'm going to search for a box collider here. And yep, there it is. So we could now go into the project and find all these components which are being used by physics and delete them, and then go through our scripts and try to find all the cases where we use uh, APIs from physics and get rid of them as well. But that's a tedious task and uh, pretty hard to not miss something. So um, we try to make this better. Uh, so this, as I said, is the 2D platformer example included in uh, the, the tutorial included in Unity. It's a 2D game. It uses 2D physics for its interactions. It shouldn't actually need the 3D physics package to run. So let's see if we can get rid of it. Um, so in 18.2, if you go to the package manager window, we are exposing the built-in subsystems, the strippable modules, through the package manager as built-in packages. So here you see a list of Unity subsystems. And here we have physics. And I click on this button to disable it. Now we see the scripts are being recompiled. And you will also see that the box collider we have here is grayed out and it has a, a warning message telling me that this uh, component is excluded from the build and it will be stripped from any player you make and it will also be uh, an inactive in, in play mode. Also, we got a compiler error here saying the type Unity engine physics has been forwarded to an assembly which is not referenced. Enable the built-in package physics in the package manager window to fix this error. Yeah, but I don't want to re-enable it, so I'm going to look at this code instead. So here we have a li line set gravity equals physics.gravity. So we're using the physics API to, to get the gravity. Well, I guess that makes sense, but then that doesn't justify adding a whole subsystem to the game. So I'm just going to replace this with vector 3 down times the constant gravity. And I recompile this project. And now everything compiles. Actually, I've been taking a shortcut here because if you take the 2D demo project, you see that there's more cases like this, but I didn't want to spend half an hour fixing compiler errors on stage because I thought that might be boring. So I did that before the presentation. Um, so now if I make a build of this project, you'll see that the build size uh, was reduced by three megabytes of uh, code per architecture. So if you're targeting a small size, this can actually be pretty significant. So you can use this to, to make Unity builds which only use a, sub, a subset of the Unity en engine functionality and have a much smaller footprint for the engine size uh, due to that. So here I'm also pretty much at the end of uh, things I have about optimizing your, the build size in Unity. But there's one more thing I want to mention. Um, that's Unity for small things. So as I, as I mentioned, there's cases where you need really small uh, builds and where, you, um, where it becomes pretty challenging to, to get to those sizes using Unity, in part due to the large size of the engine. Um, the Google Play Store, the instant uh, apps was one example. Other examples is, is WebGL, especially if you want to target uh, mobile games, which is currently pretty hard with our WebGL export. 
playable ads. If you want to have an ad banner on a web page built in Unity, you don't really want to download 10 megabytes for that. There's also games in messaging apps, like uh, iMessage has a built-in uh, has built-in apps where you can play games uh, with each other. As has uh, Facebook Messenger, as has WeChat. So at GDC this year, we announced that we're working on a new runtime called Unity for Small Things. This is a separate runtime for Unity. This is not a, a port of the whole engine. Um, but it, instead, it's a, a very small engine which compresses down to 72 kilobytes of, of JavaScript for the core runtime. It runs on HTML canvas, so it can run on pretty much any device which has a web browser. And while it's not a full uh, port of Unity, it uses the existing Unity editor and asset pipeline. So you can uh, author content in tools which you are familiar with. And um, you can also, like, if you have an existing project and uh, you want to make a playable app or a, pl a playable ad or like an, an instant game for it, you can just, uh, you have all the assets readily available and in a format you can work with. So you can use this very efficiently. I don't have any news to share on this yet, other than that we plan to release it by the end of the year. But I hear you might be seeing a glimpse more of this at the keynote tonight. We also have Vlad in the audience who's working on it. So maybe if you're lucky, you can uh, catch him around the conference. Um, and that's everything from me for now, but we have some time left. So if there's any questions, there's two microphones here. Uh, so you can uh, walk up to them and I can try to answer them. Yes, over there. Um, hello. Uh, so when you strip out, for instance, the physics module, I understand the build size is decreased, but does also the memory footprint? Um, yes, to the degree that uh, all the, uh, the native code is also loaded into memory. So depending on what you target, that may not be a significant change. But for instance, specifically in WebGL, actually the code size matters a lot for the memory footprint because typically the browsers tend to use a lot of memory for parsing all the code uh, and converting JavaScript into native code. So uh, my answer would be yes, it does uh, affect the memory footprint, but whether that's significant depends on the platform. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, maybe we take turns, so then this one. Um, I have a question regarding asset bundles. Yes. Um, in our project, we use a lot of asset bundles, and some of them made local, so they actually included in the build. Um, so, uh, sorry, I didn't get that. Some of them? Included in the build. Some of them uh, are downloaded from the internet yeah. during the runtime, and some of them are in right. the build. Right, right. Um, and it's really hard to work with assets that included in the build because you don't really know what happened with them. It's not in uh, editor log. Asset bundles is not in editor log. And yeah, and after that, it gets difficult and tedious to oh, oh, keep so track of it. So you mean like when you make an asset bundle, you want to get information like a build report on, the, on that? Sure, that's the first thing. And if you have any asset bundles included in the build, I won't at least have uh, information in general level for how, how much asset bundle is weights, not the contents of it, but the thing itself. Um, so I, I think when you build an asset bundle, the uh, build pipeline API will also return a build report object for that now. So you could f store the build reports for every asset bundle you build mm -hmm. and, and look into those for instance, using the build report uh, tool I, I shared, and then you can drill into each individual asset bundle and see how much the size footprint of all the assets in there is. Um, that said, I don't think there's any built-in way to get an overview of all your assets in your asset bundles in, in one thing. So I think you'd probably have to build that yourself. Yeah, that gets difficult. And second question is uh, regarding texture compressions. 
And uh, what about, you talked about crunch compression on Android with ETC support. What about iOS? Uh, iOS does support ETC. So you can use this on iOS as well. Does Unity support ETC for iOS? It, it does. I think we didn't expose it uh, previously because it's not a format uh, which would normally be recommended on iOS because there were no real advantages to using it over PVRTC or ASTC. Uh, but now that we added uh, crunch support for ETC, that by itself gives you a very big advantage for using ETC. So we added uh, ETC support uh, in the pop-up menu for iOS. I think if you target GLES 2, you only get ETC 1, so you don't get an alpha channel. So you have to target uh, GL GLES. But if you target GLES 3 or Metal, you should be able to use ETC 2. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, devices, it depends on device support. So some devices does not support ETC 2, but right, uh, yes. generally that's really old. Well, it, yeah, it, it depends. Any device which supports GLES 3 or Metal uh, will support ETC 2. Yeah. So if you target only those devices, you're good for using crunch on iOS, otherwise you're limited to using crunch on iOS on textures which don't have alpha channels. And which, uh, which, uh, which version of Unity ETC is available on iOS? Uh, so it, it's, it's in 17.3 where we added uh, crunch support uh, for ETC. But maybe we can go back sure, here because I see you. there's some more people. Uh, hi, Jonas, good stuff. Uh, I have a question also f uh, about textures. Uh, I, have, uh, I want to ask you if you, uh, Unity plan to uh, implement compression of um, uncompressed textures. I mean lossy or lossless. Uh, lo lossless compression of textures. This, uh, this is a subject we have been discussing and I think it's very worthwhile to, to do some research on that and see if we can build something similar to what we have with Crunch but we don't have any specific plans for that. But I, I would very much like to have something there at some point. Yeah, because it's uh, lots of textures, UI and so on. I, I, I agree yeah. and we are aware of, of the need. Yeah. Okay. So you talked about native code stripping without IL2 CPP, where you would uh, remove modules from the engine, right? Yes. Do. Uh, does this affect custom plugins too? So if I, for example, built my whole game only with plugins because I want to use my own compile process, um, do I get the benefits of code stripping there too? Generally, no. Code in your custom plugins will be used, I guess, if it is uh, called somewhere. I guess, I guess we might, d depending on the platform, uh, on some platforms we link everything together in one binary, so I'd assume that the linker would uh, take care of any function which is never called. Okay. Uh, on some platforms we would add uh, uh, custom plugins as separate uh, DLLs uh, or dilips, or, and I think then we would not perform any processing on them. Okay, but you still would uh, perform code stripping on the engine modules, right? Yes. So is that, yes. Isn't that portable? Well, the, we, we perform code stripping on the engine models uh, depending on like some information we have saying uh, this component is not used. And uh, so basically we tell the linker to only register engine models, which uh, or we, we generate some code which only calls engine models which we are known to use. And then the linker can take care of stripping the other ones. But I think that's very specific to our code. So it should, should still work for the engine models, like especially if you have all your all the code you use in, in custom plugins, you would ideally hope that most of Unity engine code can actually be stripped out. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Dino. Um, I have a question if there is a plan to actually include scripts in asset bundles. That sounds weird maybe at first. It's, it's not weird. It's, uh, it's something people have been asking about uh, before and it's... it's uh, there's no specific plans for that. There's uh, workarounds for loading code from asset bundles or from generic binary data. Um, if you are using mono on a platform with just jitting, because then there's .NET API has something like assembly.load from binary. Or I don't know what the API is called, but it's possible to, to load uh, .NET assembly from binary data. So you can load that into the game. Um, but uh, on any platform which requires all the code to be AOT compiled, 
uh, we cannot do that. And also the platform vendors don't want us to do that because uh, like on, on iOS, for instance, all the code needs to be signed and go through Apple's review process. So they don't actually want you to be able to bypass that and add any logic dynamically later on. Um, yeah, I'm actually um, was going to continue that because um, the question maybe is weird, like mm -hmm. you just uh, countered. Uh, anyhow, uh, we are experimenting converting part of the code to Vasm and actually run it in the runtime, just like a React Native app, and actually doing a code push because it's way much modeler. And uh, that really helps us to decrease our bundle size because we are much more flexible as soon we want to fix something, not right, necessarily add right. something. So I have some thoughts on that, uh, but I think they, they might be too long for yeah. this session. But I am, uh, we have an Ask the Experts area um, at the conference. And I haven't figured out where that is actually, but I am there today, I think at 11 or 12. Let me uh, tell you. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be there today from 11 to 1. So if you meet me there, we can have okay. a longer conversation about that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi there. Um, speaking about mesh compression, have you considered using a library like Draco or Corto to do this? Um, so we have been considering working on better mesh compression. Um, I don't know if Draco, for instance, would, uh, would suit our needs best. I think we might end up building something custom and we have been doing some research uh, because what we have as mesh compression right now is something I built in a day 10 years ago. So it's uh, not it's clearly not the best you can do, but I think we have nothing other than ideas at this point. So I guess, yeah, if there's no more questions, then, uh, oh, there's one more. No. <laughs> okay, then thank you for listening. <laughs>